the senator, while indoctrinated, could not explain his toxicity. You should not listen to men's rights advocates if you want to know what they have to say. Second stage tanks now pressurized. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. A feminist talking point that is growing in popular usage holds that women are discriminated against in healthcare because scientific experimentation that leads to new practices, procedures, drugs, and other therapeutic tool advancement has traditionally used mostly or exclusively male subjects. The argument is that biological differences between men and women, such as bone density, hormone balance, sex organs and their effect on other abdominal organ placement, and so on, make research done using only male subjects insufficient to determine these medical tools' effects on female patients. This, we are told, creates a risk to women where information gathered from this research may not provide enough guidance to anticipate women's medical needs or how new therapies and advice may impact women's health. This potential disadvantage, we are told, is a result of women being disregarded as a demographic. But is it? HBR Talk with Hannah Wallen One does not have to look very far into ethical considerations for medical research to realize this isn't an issue of disregarding women, but of protectiveness toward women or, conversely, of male disposability. One factor involved is the issue of potential pregnancy, which doesn't occur with men. This is a serious consideration when testing new drugs and supplements, dietary changes, exercises, or any other therapy that can affect the well-being or development of a gestating baby. To protect a gestating baby, you must protect the mother upon whose body the baby's welfare depends. Biological females can get pregnant, and the condition has historically been at least somewhat unpredictable. Biological males cannot, so the condition isn't a consideration when experimenting on men. While it can present an ethical dilemma in the use of female test subjects, historically that has resulted in women of childbearing age, at least, being excluded from some testing. That isn't discrimination against women. It's placing a higher value on the protection of women's bodies in deference to a very special use any given woman might have for hers. Another factor is the level of personal risk to the test subject himself. We didn't always have the technology we have today that can be used to carefully monitor the subject's systems, organs, and vital signs, nor the knowledge to interpret subtle changes with as much accuracy as we can today. While feminists see the end effect on women, the possibility of lower accuracy in predictions or descriptions of how medical tools will work in patient treatment when the patient is female, there were primary effects on the men who historically were used as test subjects, such as James S. Leadham, an 18-year-old freshman honors student at Seattle University who participated in a study on the safety of blood storage and died of sepsis after receiving a transfusion of blood that was contaminated with bacteria. Leadham's death was treated as more of an inconvenience to the goals of the research than a tragedy. 
Leadham's case and many others like it were highlighted in the mid-1960s by Henry K. Beecher's article Ethics and Clinical Research in the New England Journal of Medicine. Susan E. Lederer, writing for the American Medical Association's Journal of Ethics more recently, labeled that report the single most influential paper ever written about experimentation involving human subjects. Its influence, along with public awareness following World War II and the Nuremberg trials, led to advancements in considerations like informed consent and safety protocols. Medical experimentation has not become risk-free for test subjects, but it is done more carefully, with far more emphasis on these considerations. Much of the remaining risk in modern human drug trials is mitigated by test subject screening for health conditions that could predictably result in bad reactions or injury as well as the ability to identify many dangerous side effects before they get out of hand or cause permanent damage or death. When that was not the case, it would be understood that in many if not most cases, medical test subject was a moderate to high-risk job. Who is society comfortable subjecting to high-risk jobs? Men. And men are more willing to take on high levels of risk to achieve important goals than women are often with one factor being a sense of obligation to prove themselves beneficial to their communities through service and to their families through breadwinning. It's one of the factors in the so-called wage or pay gap, which is actually an earnings gap. Look at the jobs that earn hazard pay and you are more likely to find male workers than female, with some jobs exclusively or almost exclusively done by men. And now that the risk involved in acting as a medical test subject has been reduced through ethics and informed consent protocols, feminists are pushing for more test subject positions to be filled by female subjects instead of males. They see a disadvantage for women in the historically more prevalent use of men in medical research and so consider it an anti-woman slight. But the real underlying factor, even if women are disadvantaged as a side effect, is male disposability. So is the underlying factor in the feminist response, which isn't unique to the field of medical science. Workplace safety protocols improved throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, paralleled by technological improvements and devices used to perform tasks involved in homemaking, both strides that were made by a mostly male workforce and a mostly male engineering force. Homemakers gained something that had previously not been possible for anyone who could not afford hired help. With their tasks simplified and sped up by the devices available to them, they began to have time left over after their tasks for the day were completed. During this same time, the labor movement fought to restrict child labor, and wartime drafts removed men from many workplaces, now less dangerous after the implementation of rules and standards by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, workers' unions, and professional guilds. In this environment, more middle and upper class women began to take jobs. And ever since then, they've been competing with men for positions in the safer and more visibly prestigious end of the workforce, pushing more men into jobs that are less desirable, those that are hazardous, dirty, disgusting, or dismal, without a lot of visible prestige. In short, with women's encouragement and their society's respectful support, men built our entire civilization. Now, our society has withdrawn that encouragement and support, and we are actively tearing down our civilization's builders. What do you get when you displace or quash cooperative and constructive risk-takers in fields of discovery, creation, and cultural advancement? Demonize them as having wrongfully monopolized these workplaces and shape their work environment to suit replacements who are risk-averse and self-centered. What happens in those fields? You replace innovation with dysfunction and badly maintained stagnation, make the workplace hell for the remaining innovators, and deprive future generations of the benefits of their work, all because the importance of their characteristics and their contributions to society has been vastly underrated. You create a population demographic with a growing list of reasons to feel disadvantaged, aimless, insignificant, and disenfranchised. Have you wondered why so many young men were available and open to participating in the Occupy protests and the riots of 2020? Guess what most of them were not doing, and how most of them were not gaining recognition within their communities and families. Might they have chosen differently if they had valued roles they had to abandon in order to partake in those activities? If the balance went in the other direction, 
our gynocentric society would have a conniption fit. We would be hearing about the terrible issue of female disposability. Feminists would lament the risks that we as a society would have accepted as normal to impose on women just because they are women. They would decry men's displacement of women from their professions whenever male interest in a field of work increased. We would have noted that the women who had historically received recognition or at least a modicum of respect as the risk-taking innovators, developers, builders, and backbone of our civilization were being rewarded in modern times with only damage and sacrifice, dismissal, and when they engaged in any self-advocacy with defamation as greedy, selfish, or sexist. We would even be hearing how treating women in this manner harms everyone, including children. Since those things are happening to men instead, we never hear about it from outside of the community that the gynocentric media has not so affectionately labeled the manosphere. And when we talk about it, we are accused of painting men as victims of progress. Throwing half of humanity under the bus to the detriment of everyone. Discrimination when it happens to women. Progress when it happens to men for women's purported but not effective benefit. And the attitude behind that is a huge barrier to fixing the problem. This week, HBR Talk will begin discussing three ways in which male disposability is destroying civilization and why we must restore regard for men, beginning with how disposability impacts men as the drivers and foundation of our cultural advancement. You can find a link to the stream running at 7.30 p.m. Eastern at HoneyBadgerBrigade.com. And that would be right now, so hello and welcome to HBR Talk 219, Three Ways Male Disposability is Destroying Civilization. I'm your host, Hannah Wallen, here with Nonsense Annihilator, Lauren B., and our Badger-in-Chief, Allison Tiemann. And, okay, no, it is going through for a minute, I thought you guys couldn't hear me. But, nope, that technical difficulty is not happening tonight. Um, but for some reason my sound does seem a little low, so if it's really too low, let me know and I'll see if I can do something to fix it. Um, in any case, we are here tonight to talk about the repercussions of treating men who are the foundation and backbone of civilization, like the third wheel of the family, society's filler and trash, and the government's cannon fodder. But first, we've got to do what we got to do. And uh, as, as recent events keep showing us, it's getting more important every day. As always, Honey Badger Radio dishes out a smorgasbord of thought-provoking discussions, and as experiences both recent and long past have demonstrated, the provoked thoughts are fighting back. They've made it clear that for people like us, relying on third-party payment platforms like Patreon to fund our work is treading on thin ice, or building our house in the path of a rapidly growing fire. In light of this, we strongly encourage our supporters to switch at least their support for us to FeedTheBadger.com, the most stable way to help us out. And if you want to tip us directly, instead of relying on any social media platform's tip jar, the link for that is FeedTheBadger.com slash JustTheTip. As always, the same risk applies to our social media platforms, although it's possible that one of them just got protected. We we will not be holding our breath, but we'll be waiting to find out what's going to happen with Twitter now. But either way, to find our work, you should definitely further provoke the Thought Police by tracking our thought-provoking discussions on HoneyBadgerBrigade.com, where you can find your way to all of our content, regardless of our presence on other social media, and also a link to FeedTheBadger.com in the drop-down menu at the top of the page. So remember, folks... Information is power. We have it. They hate it. If you want it, you've got to go to HoneyBadgerBrigade.com and check out the latest feed from the Badgers and feed the Badger to help make it possible for us to share the news and analysis you come to HBR to hear. And now that we've heard the opening video introduce one aspect of this topic, that of men being treated as society's filler and trash, it's, uh... You know, the one out of all three that every guy faces, regardless of whether he directly faces the other two. And it affects human males from birth through old age. And regardless of their social, political, or financial status, too. Um, in fact, men cannot access civilization's rewards of higher status in any area without submitting themselves to operate under this social attitude. 
So what happens when, as feminists have demanded, the scant modicum of respect society offered to men for that sacrifice and the rewards they struggle for are taken from them and given, unearned, to women? Society spent centuries demanding that human males make usefulness to their communities, their identity. What happens when even that means of establishing an identity is ripped away and replaced with nothing? Well, it's replaced with nothing. Yeah. What do we get? What and then we, get? <laughs> we, well, uh, to be honest, if you think about it, this, this whole work of tying men's identity to the, the productive work of building society and explaining to men, because this is something that I've noticed that men have a bit of a, a blind spot for. And it's not, it's not like a real negative thing. It's just something that I think a lot of guys have a blind spot for. It's more difficult for them to, and it's understandable because it's more difficult for them to recognize how their actions are positive in the greater world. Because you really need somebody outside of yourself to do that. You, you understand what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like it's, yeah. It's, it's extremely difficult to be like, yes, I earned this gold medal in, yeah. you know, being me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I think women actually have a really powerful role in motivating and explaining to men the benefit that they give them and how they improve the world around them through their actions, through being masculine. And this work is not being done by our society but this work to connect masculinity or the the uh, the work of the masculine to the benefit of family society community is so critical to actually making sure that that work gets done so essentially what are powers that be what the powers that be in our society and the women who promote this feminist narrative which is tearing all that down are doing is they're basically just sort of you know, they, they got this this whole thing, this incredible resource, this resource that literally is the most important resource, human resource on the planet. It's more important than oil. It's it's more important than gold. It, it's it's more important than, I don't know, uranium, potash. It's more important than than any kind of food store because it's what makes those things useful, which is men's innovation, men's endeavor, men's work. That is the most important resource on the planet. And our society has just been like, yeah, we don't need that. And we don't we don't need to concern ourselves with it. We're just going to walk away. It'd be like watching someone walk away from a bar of gold and you're just sitting there. They're just like, they were on a bench and they're like, so, yeah, I don't need that. You're like, really? You don't? Do you mind if I take it? Do you mind, do you mind if the honey badgers or other women who like men do this work instead? You know, because uh, maybe, maybe that will work out. You don't want to do the work. We could do it. You know, maybe. maybe. Just, just to do a bit of a negotiation is, is that's what I'm getting at. It's like they're walking away from the work of maintaining the civilization that maintains them. Yep. It's like, well, because, he, it, because it means self defeating, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, well, it means they would have to get up and do something, Allison. Don't you know women are just supposed to have everything handed to Man, them? Is, am I not hearing you? Oh, goodness. Uh-oh. I, uh, Allison, are you not here, are able to hear Lauren? I am able to hear you guys now. Okay, okay. But, okay, yeah. yeah. Go on, Lauren. But yeah, like, as, it, as I was saying, no, women are just supposed to have everything handed to them. They're not supposed to do anything. Are you kidding me? Obligations? Those are for peasants, Allison. <laughs> You know, it does seem yeah, like that's fine. That seems <laughs> like that seems like the major attitude and and it's getting like more and more blatant and obvious and open. And one of the one of the things I keep harping on, it seems like probably to a lot of people it seems like a small thing. But to me, this is I don't know, a microcosm of how feminists fail at understanding what men do for all of civilization, right? Every year on International Men's Day, the women who want, and it's it's mostly feminist women, but occasionally I'll see women who don't identify as feminist, who like identify as, as you know, traditionalist conservative, although mostly not, um, or who are just out there talking trash, right? But mostly women that'll have like feminist in their profile labels or they have pronouns now in their name, 
Oh my gosh. Um, but uh, they'll they'll come on and and you know hashtag International Men's Day. Isn't it ironic or funny or uh, so appropriate that it falls on hashtag International Toilet Day? And I'm like, all right, I'll tell you what. You remove all the toilets from your house for maybe maybe 24 hours. And you decide afterwards how much you appreciate the man who came up with the idea of a toilet and the men who created the, the innovation, who came up with the innovation to create indoor plumbing and the men who did the work of building an entire system to get your poop away from your house so you don't have to deal with it, right? But... But no, they think that's disparaging. Like, well, yeah, maybe it is appropriate that International Men's Day and International Toilet Day are on the same day. Because, holy hell, what would we do without indoor plumbing? And what would we do without the male innovation, the male compassion, the male consideration for others, the male interest in improving things for everybody, including women, that led to that indoor plumbing what would we do without men exactly and and the hypocrisy is just so perfectly juxtaposed by those same feminists who will you know on international men's day (laughs) oh my gosh international toilet day that's 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 how much you give a damn that's how much you think about the subject forget about caring about men you don't even think about you know you don't put two and two together and say hmm well gee where did this where where did this thing, this this bowl of water in my house come from? Who put it there? Was it the toilet fairy? <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, let's just all go back to chamber pots and having to be careful which apartment complexes we watch past because people might dump them out on the sidewalk. How about that? They're so comfortable. They're so comfortable that they, it's just not even, a, a, they don't even give it a second thought. Right, and and the, the, the thing is, um, men have not in mass come out and said you know what you owe us for this be nicer to us give us some respect give us rewards give us social status give us money i mean they they get paid for their work uh, and they they will work harder for more pay to support their families but you don't necessarily see without um without women being involved men going yeah i deserve this it's usually when the labor movements worked for higher pay and better benefits and better standards. It's because uh, you know they they were appealing to the fact that women were losing their husbands, that uh, children were losing their fathers, that families were not getting enough money to live on, even though the men in the family were working twelve and sixteen hour days, and that you know. At, at, at that time, they were able to appeal to the fact that, hey, you know what, this resource is not unlimited. It's, it's actually something that, uh, you know, you can, you can overuse, you can use up, you can destroy, and so on. And if you're going to use men's work, you need to treat the resource with some respect and use it carefully. But it was something that it took, it took massive amounts of death and injury in, uh, you know, increasingly dangerous workspaces that, you know, became dangerous because of the new technology that was being used, the new machines and the changes in how, how deep and how, um, how, how carelessly we were digging into, to mines and so on, because we had new equipment that could go farther, faster and uh, deeper and so on. And, and, you know, suddenly there was a reason to protest, right? But we didn't see men in mass standing up and and just pointing at general society and saying, you owe us. You know, they they worked with their employers to get what they were owed by their employers. And we don't see men standing up very often on Twitter when, you know, some stupid feminist, oh, he he heard her International Toilet Day, Men's Day, ha ha, going, yeah, you really should appreciate this. I think... Until some of us stand up and say, hey, you know what? Maybe you should appreciate what they did for you. Um, We're going to end up in a situation where feminists are going to keep chasing men out of the workplace 
feminists are going to keep telling men that their work is not valuable and telling men that we don't need them until all of a sudden they realize that yes we do mm -hmm. and it might be too late um, you know i've been watching what? this happen in workplaces i've been in a lot of different workplaces because i do a lot of different jobs right and every place i've gone i've seen men pushed out or men pushed aside men silenced men mistreated uh, you know in a variety of other ways and and then all of a sudden something comes up that really only a man can handle and the first thing that the women do is is crow about where are the men why aren't the men handling this what are the men doing and uh, you know and they look around and they, well they've chased them out they've pushed them away they've silenced them they've they've you know told them to that they're not important and they're not valuable and why should they even bother and why should they yeah the honest to god answer is they shouldn't and to be honest i would also say that i don't know if most women are capable of making this connection um between it, I, mean, I think it takes a certain mentality of being able not to actually understand in some ways how men work how society works how men are motivated by women and put two and two together, which I think takes a lot more intelligence than average. So by definition, the average woman will not understand this and uh, won't, won't think that this is something that needs to happen. And I honestly think that feminism is actually taking and reducing the average intelligence of the average woman because they're replacing thoughtfulness with thought terminating cliches and mm -hmm. self-awareness with gratuitous bullshit about empowerment and goddessness or whatever and um so it's it's like it's a situation where i see more of a death spiral happening but on the other hand on the other hand we do live in an era of social force multiplication and what i mean by that is that social arrangements or social um behavior you can see this through twitter it's what ha what's happening on twitter we almost we're almost in an era where twitter is what well, we are in an era where twitter is making social policy and you can see this in for example the particular rules in regard to this the the health crises that we went into there were two competing groups of professional medical um uh, medical experts with two different things that they were advocating on how to deal with the medical health crisis. The one that won out was not the one with the, the, the most prestigious or the best researched, but the group of medical experts with the, with the widest Twitter reach, if you can believe it, that's I the one that it. won out. So yep. we live in an era where social media, media platforms are dictating social policy, which makes sense because they're 90, what, 5% women. So it's all women debating what is socially acceptable and what when women debate what's socially acceptable and they determine what's socially acceptable, that gets implemented as policy and it becomes what, what people will tolerate. So if enough women consider it socially acceptable for people to be censored, then people are censored. If they consider it socially acceptable to have their their mobility restricted, then their mobility is restricted. If they consider it socially acceptable for certain groups of people to be trampled, then those people will be trampled, killed. Those people will be killed. I mean, women have the unbelievable power of dictating the social expectations of a society, especially when it comes to men, which is what feminism has been exploiting for however many generations. So we're in a situation where we are in a, a Twitterocracy and social media has that power it has the power of being a force multiplier for social opinion and arrangement because twitter itself is a particular way of arranging conversation or or not really it 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 it, it reduces conversation to its most it's like a pun you know pun is the lowest form of humor 
Twitter is the mo- lowest form of con- conversation. Yeah. And, it's a, and it's as a, a result... challenge to um, to communicate on Twitter, but I wouldn't call it the lowest form of, of communication. There's a skill to being succinct. And I think yeah, people... Yeah, true enough. And it, it's that way with puns as well. I think people miss that when they call those Of course you're forms. defending puns. Oh, of course I am. <laughs> uh, as, the, as the pun master in chief, I do take issue with... Um, but but seriously, with the denigration of puns, <laughs> yes, the denigration of puns. But seriously, the like, punishment of puns, like people Pun do with one-liners. You know, people will say, "Oh, one-liners are 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 just you know crap humor." It's like clickbait. But the truth is, if you try to create a one-liner, and and uh, you know you try to create a one-liner on the topic of something complicated, it's very hard to do. And and if if you're able to do it quickly and easily, and um, without you know, without having to sit around and think about it, uh, you really have a lot of skill there, really a lot of talent um, in order to be able to do that. And it's the same thing with, I, I've seen people do that with Twitter where um, they're able to create, because Twitter is the art of the one-liner, pretty much. Mm-hmm. And I've seen people create beautiful one-liners on Twitter that communicate, uh, you know, a thousand words worth of uh, getting the point across but they only take just a sentence or two worth of characters and it's it is a way to be brilliant you just have to work at it yeah it well, it do it do be like that though sometimes <laughs> exactly <laughs> and that's but the perfect over- ex- <laughs> perfect example okay. <laughs> but my overall point is that we live in an era where social media and how we're connected in communication is a force multiplier for social expectations and it's possible that that encourages a kind of competition between how we arrange uh, relationships between people either to be productive or destructive. And if you manage to create a situation where you are creating productive relationships between men and women, and as a result, a productive, productive community, you may end up in a, well, while every other woman is destroying her her community, her society, and the things that she relies on for her existence, there may be some women who aren't. And because we live in a world of forced multiplication, that may multiply itself. Does, does that, I, yeah. I, do you see what I'm saying? So we're getting like a competition going because of, of how social media works or even not forms of social media, but social, co- I, I, co- I would say community. Like for example, Discord is more of a social community. Um, Twitter is more of social media, but there's ways of, of sort of prototyping how to deal with men and women. We could do these in these social communities and maybe in the future there'd be a force multiplier that allows the successful ones to gain more, uh, uh, you know, to, to become more successful and propagate themselves more is what I'm getting. So we're, we're getting into sort of this evolutionary thing. And um, ultimately, if, if that happens then the women who are unsuccessful with supporting and helping men be inspired to do the work that is necessary to keep a civilization running will self-select themselves out of this out of this sort of evolutionary process and those women who do or are capable of doing this work will then be selected for. Does that make sense? Oh, I hope so. I mean, it does make sense and I hope I hope that uh, the the women who you know, who aren't aren't willing to to do that work, um I hope they do end up dropping out of the the social media well spectrum. It's to a not degree. necessarily that they'll they'll drop out, but what will happen is they'll be so destructive to the very systems that sustain them. That it, they'll just be evolutionary dead ends, and it, yeah. I'm, I'm using evolutionary as a very loose term because I'm I'm talking more like the evolution of technology, the evolution of social understanding, that kind of thing, rather than the genetic evolution of humanity. But if you are a woman who insists on taking a saw, sitting on a chair, and then sawing the legs out from under you. You know, the the idea is that eventually that's uh, that's going to be your problem, not anybody else's. And you deserve the broken tailbone that's going to come from that, actually. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, and, you do. Yeah. You know, but the, the, the really the bad thing that I see in this is, 
you know, we have, um, we uh, uh, even though we have a lot of men who are aware of the problem of tolerance for that behavior of, of sawing the legs out from under the chair, you know, you're sitting on, and even worse, blaming the guy that made the chair or blaming the nearest man for not stopping you from using that saw uh, and, and not being, you know, immediately picking you up and carrying you to the hospital or whatever. Um, we, we, we have an unfortunate pattern in men that contributes very, very heavily to their being the backbone of society, but also contributes very heavily to their being vulnerable to that type of abuse. And that is that because they love women as a, as a population, men love women as a population. And they've demonstrated it over and over again in every way that I can think of. Um, and they treat women with deference, right? And they treat women with unearned respect and a huge, immeasurable amount of compassion and consideration and um, really lenience in terms of uh, tolerance for stupidity uh, and, and things like that. Uh, so we end up in a situation where women do shit like that and they blame men for it and men are like okay you know like the Eddie Murphy okay the the from Eddie Murphy raw where he talks about you know women women behaving in a manner that is abusive and because they are women and because men love them um which is as a really bland paraphrase of what he actually did say men will you know lower their heads and say okay okay and they will take it and they will um allow for it and they will not only condone it, but accommodate it. And it hurts them every single time. And, and there needs to be a way where women who are willing to do the work of um, communicating to men the, their value in society and, and the value of the things that they do, um, where we can get across to them that, you know, don't, don't stab yourself with that knife, right? Don't don't let that woman stake you through the heart with the legs she just sawed off of that chair because it's not your fault she did that and it's not your responsibility to fix it for her. And if you do, you're doing it out of kindness and you are owed appreciation for that. You know, especially if she's demanding that you do it and you meet that demand. And we need to have a um, a better means of communicating or at least a better pattern of communicating to men that they don't have to put up with that shit. Um, yeah. I don't know if I... Uh, hopefully I'm making sense on this. It's men have to be yes. able to stand up for themselves too. And they have to be able to do what MGTOW do and say, no, fuck you. I'm not fixing your chair. I'm not getting you to the hospital. You did this to yourself. Stop cussing me out. And you know, ask me nicely and maybe I will help you. Uh, because sometimes if, if men don't do that, we end up with a huge pattern of abuse and it hurts them. And well, then it hurts the rest of society too. So even if you don't care about men, you really should care about what that's going to do to everybody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, con well, considering if we recognize, we recognize the profound effect that women have on the social landscape and honestly i i know people are some men say well we can have like um uh, sex dolls and i'm like mm, they're already programming sex dolls to be bitchy yeah they uh, are. and it's because it's not because it, it, it's because men want something to to provide for you know they want a challenge so even if you got rid of women the traps would become the new women so it's it's just it's just sort of the nature of the beast, and there is there's a there's a give a quick you know there's a there's a um, back and forth happening here. So it's it's not just women; it's also women living up to the expectations of men in a very dysfunctional way. And I'm I will admit that I know I, I don't mean that this is to down, to downplay the negative effect on men, but I'm just building on what you're saying about how men choose women who are dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And part of it is because women who are dysfunctional make them feel useful. Uh, but what I think needs to happen is we need to recognize the profound effect that women have in the social 
landscape and setting the social agenda, which is obvious to me. We need to recognize it. We need to start making women, holding women accountable for their effect on it. And we need to start telling men it is okay to recognize the fact that you are a simp because all men are simps, even Muslim men. And it is that that's just the nature of the beast. It's how you were made. It's how you evolved. If men didn't simp for women, the human race would be dead. I like it's how you say even that. Muslim men when the motivation is what? 72 virgins? <laughs> even? Yeah. What do you mean even? Yeah, I know. I, I, it's, I, I say that because I, I know that people are No, they don't. No men on the planet hate their women. No men don't simp for their women. No men don't construct a society that protects their women and provides for their women. It's just that every culture has their different ideal of what that provision and protection looks like. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's the difference. So every, like, it's okay to accept that. And in accepting that, recognize that you have the right, if not the responsibility, to look at women and say, is this worth simping for? Is this worth simping for? Is this worth, and I'm just being humorous, is this woman, is, is it even possible to simp for this woman? It, it, to have anything successful or anything good come out of you know, providing and protecting this woman? And if it's a woman who cannot love you or doesn't even like men, there's nothing productive that's going to come out of it. If it's a woman who won't acknowledge the effect that she has on you, nothing productive will come out of it. And that's it. It's like, and the, the reason why I put it this way is that we get into this sort of mentality where we're like, well, we, we got to, men have got to stop simping. And I've, I, I was in this mentality for most of the time that I've advocated for men's rights until, you know, and it was this one moment where one guy came to me and said, you know, that's never going to happen. So the best you can hope for is that men choose a better quality of women to simp for. And yeah. And I, at the time he said that, I was like, no, men need men need to just f get rid of us and forget us and don't want to. And it took years for me to just be like, you know what? He's right. This isn't going to change. You're not going to change the nature of the beast. However, we can recognize the nature of the beast and give men the tools and the means to mediate it. Just like, you know, we, we recognize that women are vulnerable when they give birth, but we don't put them out in a field with the damn lions to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know like men are vulnerable to this so let's give them the tools and the means to uh simp safely <laughs> yeah yeah uh, it, oh in, in a way that is a good way to put it and yeah like even even though you know we we do talk about for instance, the the um, phenomenon, and I, I hate when people call it a movement because it's not like that. People aren't organizing uh, to, to recruit people into it and make it uh, yeah. make changes in society with it. But men going their own way, the phenomenon of men going their own way, right, is tiny. You know, for every man going his own way, there's probably thousands going, yeah, I'll do that. You know, and and a lot of times it, the the reward that they're getting today is, I know I helped because I can see the effects, not because someone said thank you, or because someone said, hey, that really made things easier or better or whatever for me, uh, but because they they are able to observe, and recognize where they helped, and it's it's sad, um, it's sad because. That nature in men, it's it's it is what um, you know has advanced society. All of the things we have in society that are great, and it's also why men are exploitable to do all of the things in society that are not great. And it's also why it's going to be hard as hell to convince women that we do need to go back to a better balance where we we do appreciate men and we do recognize what they do and we do stop trying to step on their toes every chance we get right um we used to have a standard of behavior a standard of, of behavior for being recognized as a respectable woman 
we still have a standard of behavior for being recognized as a respectable man, right? And if you don't meet that standard of behavior, even if you don't do things that will get you put in jail, if you fail at that standard of behavior just enough to not be recognized as a, a, a quality man or a man who deserves a little respect or a man who deserves a little recognition or even a man who deserves to be in the same room with other people, right? You get treated as a creep. You get treated as an inconvenience to the people around you. You get disinvited, uninvited. Um, you get told off. You get uh, the police called on you. You get all kinds of repercussions. You get the shit kicked out of you by other men who are treated as heroes for doing so. And mm -hmm. women don't have that. We don't face that, right? We get the shit kicked out of us by other women for other stupid reasons. But we can be absolute bitches and, and treat everybody around us like pieces of dirt under our feet. And there will be people who will, will treat that as a respectable behavior. Like, this woman is a strong woman. No, she's not. She's just a bitch, right? A strong woman, an alpha woman, if you want to put it that way, just like an alpha man or a strong man is someone who provides care for the people around them, right? A person who uh, demonstrates their value to the people around them, not a person who just demands that, that people uh, assign them a value. And unfortunately, women have forgotten that. You know, how we treat other people isn't allowed to matter anymore. And we've lost something that made women great in history. And as a result, the women who are the most famous today are the ones who do things like posting uh, video on, on social media of how they can uh, pop open a, a bottle of champagne just right so that the stream will hit a glass balanced on their their stuck out ass right or or the women who uh can be the most egregious and comical you know professional train wreck you know, the woman who uh, makes herself the most helplessly beautiful by putting on the most bizarre combination of makeup and clothing possible Right? Those are the women who are famous. Um, the women who are, are famous are the ones that, that start fights. Right? The ones that um, start whole cancel culture uh, campaigns against other people just by posting a single tweet or a single image on Facebook. Um, we, we, when we sing about how great men are, like, we sing ballads about how they performed in battle, or about the work they did in history, or about uh, how rich they are and powerful they are. But we don't, we don't sing ballads about how mean they are very often, right? When we do, um, you end up with, like, Big Bad Leroy Brown, where the guy, we, we sing about how mean the guy is, and oh, he gets his comeuppance, right? Um, oh, the poor guy gets his comeuppance. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's how yeah, we no, sing about how great men are, right? But when we clear, sing about clearly, women... Clear, clearly you haven't listened to enough gangster rap. Oh, okay? yeah, <laughs> gangster rap is a different story. Um, and, and honestly, in a way, it's respectable just because of that. Right. right? But it's also some of the most demonized music in existence. I mm -hmm. mean, if, if I was to tell my kids to never listen to a particular type of music... Um, you know, like, which I wouldn't do because there isn't really a type of music that they should just never listen to. But I have told them this, don't immerse yourself in only this type of music. It isn't mm -hmm. gangster rap. It's, it's death metal. Yeah. Because it's the, the, the dark themes, although they're a great way of expressing and getting out, um, some anger and, and other dark emotions that are, they're hard to deal with. If you immerse yourself in it. It increases your experience of those emotions and dominates your emotional experience with that type and takes away from your ability to experience other emotions on the same level. And I've put myself in that situation and done that, so I know. Um, but I, and I, it's possible that, that gangster rap and um, 
you know, the heavier blues can do the same thing. But we don't glorify men. You know, if you look at gangster rap, the, the glorification of men in gangster rap is more about uh, glorif- glorifying rebellion against society's standards mm-hmm, mm-hmm. than it is about glorifying men. And women who are glorified in, in gangster rap are, are similarly glorified for abandoning society's standards, rebelling against society's standards. But what do we get with, with uh, pop music that glorifies women? We get, I'm a bitch, isn't that great? What a mm-hmm. what a powerful bitch I am. Look at me. Everybody values me for my cunt. What a powerful cunt I have. My genitals are the most important thing about me. Look at them. <laughs> Think about them. Talk about them. Like, that's what we get for women. And it's women who are driving that. Mm-hmm. Right? So our standard for for what makes a great woman has fallen so far and so hard as a result of women's own choices that we can't even identify as a as a population we can't even identify with men anymore because we don't know what it's like to have a standard for what makes us great and women don't understand self-sacrifice the way that men understand it anymore they don't understand it the way women in, in history understood it and they complain about it in the most m- minute of situations you know, and and I can't do it as well as Prim, but like emotional labor is the stupidest narrative, and, and it's it's been warped from what the original writer of the 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 topic creator of that topic um, came up with. But I, everything that I see women posting about it online um, is is essentially how dare you put me in a situation where the right thing to do is care about your humanity. That's the emotional labor narrative in a nutshell, Mm -hmm. right? Where if you turn around and look at what the same women are demanding of men, it's you better care about my humanity or I'm going to condemn you as a demon. And and that's where we are. And I, I think with respect to men's labor and men's position in society, men's, um, exercise of authority, men's exercise of responsibility, uh, men's exercise of compassion, men taking all of the initiative and all of the risks uh, to be the leaders, the people that are most likely to get assassinated for for the decisions that they make in society. Um, Because nobody's going to, you know, shoot at uh, the the Kardashian chick, Kim Kardashian, for... uh, posting a video of champagne hitting a glass on her ass, right? Nobody's going to nobody's going to care about that, right? Because it's not it doesn't really impact society in a way that people recognize. Yeah. But the guy who signs bills into law after a whole group of people vote for them and everybody voted whether or not all of those people are going to be in office has to have one of the most elite and sophisticated teams of bodyguards ever to exist because of the risk that he might get shot at for his decisions, even when they benefit people. So you look at the history of, of, of men taking those responsibilities and women just trashing that. Um, we're We're in a situation now where we're losing out as a society on the benefits of of those men on the benefits of those responsibilities being taken on um the advancements that are being made and on the wisdom of that decision making right now we are promoting uh men who kowtow to women men who are told what to do by women and and to a degree where they are not allowed to think for themselves. We're promoting uh, men who will step aside and let women take over even when they can't handle the job. And we're seeing more wars, we're seeing bridges fall, we're seeing society crumble, we're seeing our economy crash, we're seeing hyperinflation begin. Right? We are at the, we're like on the cusp of that one. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of really 
harsh consequences in our society. And we're just at the very beginning. We're at the top of the hill on the roller coaster. And we can't even see the bottom. And, and I just want to yeah. point out, Twitter, driven by women, setting the social agenda, was the reason why we chose a particular set of activities that directly impacted our economy in response to a health crisis. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was not necessarily the most practical or the most advisable. Right. There were two competing sets of potential guidelines from medical experts that were at least equally uh, equally reasonable or equally legitimate in terms of, uh, of their expertise, if, if not the one that failed or wasn't, wasn't taken, was the one that didn't go. So we are looking at a situation where women are setting the social agenda, and they set a social agenda that directly led to all of this is what i'm getting at yeah if you if you see the connection there hannah yeah and yeah. and this is and it, this is remember a while back we did a show on the dangers created by by reliance on safety nets i and, and this has been probably it's probably been like a year ago but we discussed the fact that as a result of reliance on safety nets people will take risks that are stupid, they don't have a great reward coming for that risk because, well, they've got a safety net, so the potential consequences don't look as bad, right? At, but they, then if there is a risk that is worth taking because the reward is great and, and necessary and important, but there is no safety net, people won't take it. Or they will try to create a safety net that detracts from the ability to achieve that reward. And we've seen that. I, I We might even have discussed that before the crisis of the last two years. Uh, and, and that is a female-driven, largely female-driven um, behavior. And uh, as a result, you end up losing out on those rewards. And you end up losing people when the safety nets fail. People can fall through the safety nets, fall through the cracks, fall through the holes, whatever. Um, and there are unpredictable holes in your safety nets. And you can get, you can strangle yourself with a safety net too. The welfare system has demonstrated that in mass. Yeah. And uh, you can strangle your your uh, whole neighborhood with that safety net. You can strangle your whole community with that safety net and your whole economy. And we have done so. So, yeah, women women uh, controlling the narrative on social media and um, failing to appreciate the, the ability of men to make those decisions in regard to risk and reward without a safety net, which they have been doing, by the way, since before recorded history, um, successfully since before recorded history. And our, our civilization evolved around men doing that since before recorded history, right? But now we have created a situation where we have taken away all the benefits of that. And we have, we have created the type of safety net that strangles society and tied everybody up in it. And we are socially executing people. I, I do like, um, I like that, that term, uh, the social execution um, in, in regard to cancel culture, because it is, it's an excommunication from uh, polite society. And and now it's becoming an ex excommunication from economic society as well. So it's, it really is a social execution. Right? And we're social ex socially executing people for um, being damaged and, and complaining about being damaged by the strangling safety net, right? So there's a lot of shit that's happening as a result of us treating men as completely disposable in in terms of their position in society as the innovators, the workers, the movers, the shakers, the uh, support system, you know, for everything that that makes our our uh, culture what it is, you know, like all of the the devices, all of the infrastructure, all of the standards for for behavior everything all falls on men it all rests on men's shoulders and when we treat them as well you can just pull this part of the foundation of society out and throw it away and you can pull this part you really are cutting the legs off of your chair 
And uh, one of the ways in which we have just sawed the shit out of those legs is fathers. And that's, so we we talked a lot about, you know, the underlying one. Fathers are vital to the welfare of their children. And we've done whole shows on this. Um, children of involved fathers, as opposed to children who have been estranged from their fathers. Uh, there's documented evidence that they have advantages if they're, they're, they've got involved fathers, fathers who are in the home, fathers they see regularly even if they're not in the home, um, fathers who are part of the decision-making process in the rules that the child grows up with, the um, systems of, of support that the child has, and so on. Right? Those children are, end up better equipped to deal with their social situations with other people. They end up more personally accountable they end up performing better in school. They end up bet with better mental mental health, less likely to have mental health uh, conditions affect their lives in a way that detracts from their ability to engage with the rest of their community, earn a living, and so on. And so they end up um, reaching farther in education. They end up uh, doing better in the workplace where they, they earn more money. They uh, progress farther if they're moving up the ladder in the workplace, they find better jobs and so on. Uh, they're more likely to find life partners, get married, um, and stay married instead of ending up divorced. They're less likely to end up on the criminal side of the law. They're less likely to end up on welfare. They're less likely to end up um, suffering the consequences of, of foolish decisions where they end up injured and or disabled um, because of, of risk-taking that wasn't well advised. So when we take fathers away from children, we directly harm children. We are robbing them of uh, a nurturing that is as important as their food, their clothing, their shelter, everything that we say that is the only thing that we need from fathers. When we tell them, you can't see your children, but you have to pay child support, right? Um, so this is something that, you know, when we, when we watch our society doing this to men, and a as men's rights activists, of course, we recognize the damage that this does to men. We see men who have committed suicide and left videos describing the pain and suffering that they experience when the most important people from their lives, the most important people uh, in their entire existence, are, are blocked from their existence, right? And, you know, many of us are close to men who have experienced that, and we've watched them go through the pain while they fought for the ability to just contribute anything to their children's lives. Uh, so that's another one that when we talk about male disposability, the disposability that has been imposed on fatherhood, which is not um, a, 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 an historical factor, that's a modern factor, right? That has done a huge amount of damage to our society. And we are watching it now with, you know, as I talked about in the video, um, young men who aren't building their identity by demonstrating their impact on society, their value in society with work and their engagement with other people in their community um, that end up in these humongous protest groups, and many of which have been violent and destructive. Right? They're, uh, many of those young men have been raised without their fathers. And it does take away from their ability to decide whether that lifestyle choice is of value to them, right? So then you find, you know, we, I, I follow, um, uh, gosh, I can't think of his name, the journalist that, that covers Antifa, that they keep attacking him and, and assaulting Andy him. Andy No. Yeah, Andy No. I Andy follow no. Andy No on Twitter. And periodically I'll see him post, um, mugshots and other information of uh, people that have been arrested in these protests. And quite often, there will be young men in these pictures that just look absolutely shocked, you know, mm -hmm. when they're getting their mug mugshot taken. Like, how did I end up in this situation? Because they don't understand. And uh, it's, 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 
it's it's like the uh, the story of the you know the frog boiling in the pot. You know, right. it, it just doesn't doesn't from what I hear it doesn't really actually happen. That's not <laughs> you can't boil a frog in a pot and not have the frog hop out. But anyway, but but that's exactly what it is you're in it so deep and it seems nice you know it feels good you're swimming around it feels like you're doing the right thing then all of a sudden it's like whoa whoa <laughs> yeah why are, why are my feet so hot you know but yeah it, and that's it's... exactly what's happening to them that they're they're following the guidance of the women around them the women that have told them that society just isn't geared enough even though everything in society has always been about protecting and providing for women, everything is not enough. You have to do more. And they're trying to do more. And most of these most of these young men are not malicious. They're misguided. And they're they're doing what they believe to be the the um the best thing that they the best way that they can show their support for the women around them. Right? They are warriors for their mothers and their sisters. They're warriors for the the women of the Black Lives Matter movement, right? They're warriors for the women of the Occupy movement and the women of the uh, Antifa movement. Um, and, did you mean? I'm sorry. Did, did you mean to say the uh, millionaires of the Black yeah, Lives Matter movement? Yeah, the millionaires <laughs> of the Black Lives Matter movement. Right? <sighs> We're supposed to see the Black Lives Matter movement as the faces, as as mothers and sisters and and, and so on, as, as the faces, you know, that have, that have lost because their men have been shot by police right mm -hmm. but what is there there's millionaires at the head of it that got a lot of other people to give them money out of sympathy and then went and, and instead of giving back to their communities and making a difference in their communities they let a whole bunch of other people go to jail on their behalf and they bought mansions and mm -hmm. they live in luxury and they're getting away with it because they're women because if a man did that he'd be in jail just like the men that they manipulated. So, uh, like, fatherhood, um, the disposability of fatherhood is essentially creating a situation where the next generation, the entire next generation, and the generations after that are crippled. Mm -hmm. and I yeah, know, I mean... Allison, do you have it? I was going to say, <laughs> you, you, you speak up, though, Lauren. I was gonna say. I mean, um, it, I'm here. Okay, I'm I want here. To be sure. <laughs> no, yeah, I was just. Uh, I, I've been uh, working steadily in the background on a few items. Of, okay, you know, like uh, uh, setting up an event for the evening. We're gonna watch a movie, um, and then uh, also setting up the pop up at the uh, the website. And if you want to see that pop up, you can go to feedthebadger.com, and the pop up will pop up, and it will take you now to the tip thing. Awesome. Um. Yes, so that's that sorted at least for now. I'll have to change that pop up when we do the monthly fundraiser. But uh, yeah, and again, you can go to feedthebadger.com slash just the tip to help us out with that. Um, and uh, yeah, well, actually, honestly, I wanted to ask you. So you said there were three. Yes. <laughs> and the third... I'm imagining that the f fatherhood was okay. So the first one was uh, the not recognizing men for right. their sacrifices and this is this is something that i actually talked about in 2019 and i got piled on on twitter i said on memorial day that we need to recognize that sacrifice in war is overwhelmingly male period we need to recognize that oh yeah and and uh and i got piled on um by people who essentially said, well, you know, but what about the women? And it's like, yeah, the, okay, sure, that's fine. But it's overwhelmingly male. Like, this is a male expectation. Do you see in the Ukraine? Like, this is a male yeah. expectation. When a society in two faces ways, an too. ex... It's, overwhelming. when a... it's overwhelmingly male because men are the people who have overwhelmingly done it, either volunteer or by obligation forced obligation but it's also overly overwhelmingly male because men are uniquely Expected. imposed uh, imposed on with that obligation in mm -hmm. most of the world it's very rare for for a nation to have um military obligation for women 
right? Okay, and, it's and the only reason in the most desperate search situations that they do. And the reason why I pointed this out, and I thought this is really critical. This is this this needs to be recognized, and it needs to be recognized on the day that is set aside for recognizing death and war. And this is the reason why it needs to be recognized. Okay, the group of people that is expected to lay down their lives when society faces an existential threat is by definition not the group of people benefited most by society. Okay? When we recognize that fact, it completely negates any kind of argument about by soci about society that men benefit from society more than women do. By definition, they can't. Mm -hmm. It's impossible for them to be benefiting more from a society that expects them to die to protect itself. Okay? That, that it's a, it, and we need to recognize that. And every understanding of the relationship between men and women that becomes popular or, or has influence needs to recognize that. Otherwise, it is going to be a lie that ends up destroying our society. Okay? And that's what I was getting at. And I said that in 2019, and what happened in 2020? We started down a very dark path, shall we say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's because we don't recognize, or we have this attitude towards the relationship between men and women based on a fundamental and erroneous lie about our nature. And the 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 biggest counterexample of that lie is the re reality that men are expected. And they expect themselves in many cases because ma male volunteers to war have vastly outnumbered any female volunteers throughout all of human history, even even in those times when women could volunteer. OK, so this is not just an expectation placed on men. It's an expectation they place on themselves and they are willing to enforce on other men. And if we don't recognize that, then we believe falsehoods about ourselves. And those falsehoods that you can't have a functional society based on these kinds of profound lies about our nature. Mm. And uh, yeah, so that 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 idea that um, we can't recognize that I think, which is number one in your theory, uh, uh, number one in your reasons that male disposability is um, is going to uh, our, our inability to contend with it will lead to societal collapse. Well, the reason number one is because when we can't recognize it we are lying about ourselves yeah we are lying about how civilization functions and when you lie like I mean, if you're going to be a car mechanic and you're gonna be like you know i'm gonna throw out i'm gonna throw out the manual on how this machine works and i'm gonna assume that everything is being run by unicorn farts and pixie dust <laughs> and i'm gonna get out my i'm gonna get out my 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 chakra crystal and I'm gonna meditate this, you know, this this uh this broken carburetor back into life. <laughs> That's the stupidity we're dealing with when we refuse to acknowledge the fundamental aspects of human nature that underlie societal functioning. I'm gonna, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna send my thoughts and prayers to this to engine. <laughs> I'm gonna send my thoughts yeah. and prayers. Spell okay, -H -H yeah, that's, yeah, it's not gonna work. No. So when we fail to recognize that men are men are expected to make the big sacrifices to run society, therefore society by definition can't be for their benefit at the expense of women, we fail to recognize aspects of human nature and the fundamental necessities of having a society. And then we fail to have a society. Okay, that's number one, right? We don't recognize men's sacrifice in to the degree that we absolutely should. And then number two is, of course fathers but now i'm curious what is number three number three is the use of men as cannon fodder in war and oh. which which you have been meant and here's you know you mentioned the first part of why right here's the second part of why and this is something that um you know generation xers I got asked about this on twitter one time somebody somebody was uh just freaking out about the sort of renewal of the Cold War that is represented by the tensions between the United States and Russia and Ukraine um, that are currently occurring. And I can understand 
why people who didn't grow up during the Cold War would be freaking out about this. Um, but Gen, Gen Xers are mostly not. And probably baby boomers aren't really anymore either. Um, when you grew up, like the baby boomers did, with here's how to duck and cover under your desk in the case of a nuclear attack, and like Gen X did with, well, you know, um, whichever country you live in, the other one's going to bomb you into oblivion tomorrow, so enjoy today, um, right? Because that was it. We were, we were all, the bomb was going to fall any time, and we were all going to die, so, you know, live it up, party it up, you know, try out those new drugs, those new uh, 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 synthetic drugs that are coming out on them, because, you know, you're not going to be around tomorrow anyway. Don't save your money. Don't do this, you know, and, and a lot of... Um, the 70s and the 80s, a lot of the social rebellion and during that time period happened because people had that attitude, well, we're not going to be here tomorrow, they're, they're going to drop the bomb. So, you know, might as well just live it up, right? And, uh, yeah, we, we, it's, we, we survived, you know, 20, 30 years of that, depending on how old we are, you know, and, and watched uh, the Berlin Wall come down and watched the Soviet Union break up, and then got to hear about, oh, hey, guess what? The the USSR's nukes are now in the hands of countries full of terrorists and, and um, very, very unstable governments and stuff like that. And we've survived that too, right? So we've survived all of that. We survived AIDS being completely untreatable. So we're not scared because of Cold War conditions being being re started right but i understand why younger generations are but none of that none of that is what scares me what scares me is the idea that we have a president in office who might decide to get us involved in a ground war another proxy ground war um in ukraine with russia because russia bad Ukraine good, which is not true. Ukraine bad, Russia bad. Ukraine right about some things, Russia right about some things, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's not our fight, right? It right. is partly our fault. And getting involved every chance that we get is what makes it partly our fault, right? The The Ukrainian side of the war is continuing specifically because they think they can appeal to the United States to come in on their side. Well, hey, and I mean, come on. Why would they think otherwise? Well, come on. Look, Corn Pop was a bad dude, and all Joe <laughs> Biden had to do was pull out his switch knife, all right? And, right. And that, that was it. He took care of it. Come on. Come on. Come on, man. <laughs> and see, the thing is, if, if you know about uh, World War history, and you go all the way back to World War One. And you look at the end of World War I and the treaty that was made after that war and the punishment that was inflicted on Germany and how that punishment led to the rise of Hitler, how Russia's involvement and, and extend, uh, extended involvement, no less, led to the, the fall of the Tsars and the rise of the communists and the creation of the Soviet Union, how the destabilization that took place in the Middle East during World Wars One and Two, and post-World War II Cold War proxy war in Afghanistan between uh, the United States and Russia led to Al-Qaeda and every terrorist organization since, right? And, and it all goes back to Woodrow Wilson deciding that he wanted the United States to be involved in World War I, even though we didn't have a reason. We didn't have to be. We didn't have a valid reason, right? So we didn't, we didn't even need in that war. Uh, we didn't have a, a, a dog in that fight, right? All of that leads to actual destruction, not just like the, the, the recognizable destruction of our social fabric, and our economy, but out and out, we are living in a renewal of of the fear that, yeah, the bomb's going to fall tomorrow and we're all going to die, so you might as well just live it up today, right? We are living in a renewal of the fear that after decades of no such thing happening, 
and feminists being able to to uh, poo poo men's rights uh, talking uh, activists talking about the draft with well there hasn't been a draft in how long right we're looking at the potential for that to happen again we're looking at the potential for young men the young men who have been crippled by uh, and as a generation by by having their fathers taken away from them being raised in a an environment where everything about masculinity has been made toxic by the women women around them and the way they talk about masculinity and men and the way they present it and the examples they provide right those men the men who are the least equipped of any men throughout history to be just plucked out of their normal lives and sent to fight in war those men are now in danger of being plucked out of their normal lives and sent to fight and die in war and that disposability that male disposability allows leaders who have no business leading a military force and deciding who goes to war and what nations get attacked and what landscapes get destro destroyed and what people's homes get taken away forever and and what people lose their their husbands and their fathers and their their sons and their friends and what men lose their lives those people are easily able to make those decisions and foist it off on the rest of society sell it to the rest of society because the men whose lives they are spending the blood they are paying with is treated like it doesn't matter like the actual heat death of civilization will come from that if we don't end it but I think we should go to super chats so I think that's a really good place yeah I can't add anything to that yeah. yeah. So we may not. We, we have to end that, and we have to uh, do the super chats. And I just want to remind everybody: if they want to send, one of the benefits of going to feedthebadger.com slash just the tip is it. There's no oversight. You can you can make a nice long comment. Okay. Um, please don't make it too long though. Please don't send a novel. Um, and uh, but. PayPal doesn't look at it because I've had people send me comments through PayPal and PayPal's, you know, eyeballed it and said, I think this is slightly suspicious because you mentioned one of our verboten words. No. Uh, I think in, in that, <laughs> in that case, I think it was, I think it was out uh, indoors and he said something about terrorism and I'm like, Oh God, please don't, <laughs> don't send me, don't send me text through PayPal about and it was not, it was an, it was not like a, a, a comment on, it wasn't, it was like a comment about terrorism I, that wasn't for terrorism, of course. It was just referencing it. And, uh, and PayPal was like, I think I will yoink this and take a closer look at it and, and not release it for two months. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want an option that YouTube has no control over and PayPal has no control over and just goes directly to our eyeballs, that option is feedthebadger.com slash just the tip. I do have two from earlier today if you want to go through them. Um, yeah, um, but before you before we go on to the super chats, there is something that you brought up there. Um, uh, and, and this is something that, you know, needs to be said, right, regarding terrorism. Terrorism is a result of people thinking that they have no other voice in society, no other way in society to get their grievances considered by the rest of society, right? Now, it, it's not something that I support, right? It's something that I oppose, um, but it doesn't, when people have other avenues for getting their ideas considered, their grievances considered, and, and uh, finding whatever compromise they can find so their needs get met without them having to cause harm in society to get people to pay attention they don't engage in terrorism because the consequences for being that person that engages in terrorism generally uh, start with bad experiences and and you know end with death for yourself and possibly your entire family right 
you know, going up to the, the, the point of having the mother of all bombs dropped on your complex. Um, so terrorism is a last resort, not a primary way of dealing with things. And the majority of people who find themselves in that position are disenfranchised men and men who are denied a means of, of uh, making themselves um, part of a family, right? And, and denied this because they are on that, that platform beneath the bottom rung, one of the two basement levels beneath the bottom rung of the social and economic ladders. Right? The guys that, that uh, strap bombs to themselves and blow themselves up at, at weddings um, or, or, or in political environments, the guys that um, you know, burn down buildings, the, the guys that attack whole neighborhoods in the United States and burn down buildings here, um, the guys that, that take people hostage and, and cut their heads off, all of that violence, uh, none of those guys are doing that just because they're assholes. They're doing it because they're desperate and uh, they've had the promise of a better afterlife or they've had a promise from somebody in, you know, from, from the people that promote these ideas to them that after they tear the existing society down that a better society will be built from the rubble. And uh, when we lie to them and, and tell them that their only value in the world is to be that sacrifice, that communication of desperation to the rest of society, and we take away all of their other avenues for expressing their grievances and finding a balance between, say, their culture and their interests and the culture and interests of the people around them, we create terrorism. Just like, you know, the, the trope of, of Batman creating all of his own enemies. And we use male disposability to do it. So, uh, I'm, I, that's, I just wanted to point that out. Because when we hear about terrorism and everybody's like, oh, a reason to condemn men. You know what? No, terrorism is a reason to condemn society. It's a reason to condemn male disposability. You can't have terrorism without disposability. And most terrorists are disposable males. Um, so I'm looking at Super Chats in a set of places here. Uh, I've got... Um, How would the, I do mine? Yeah, I was going to say the earliest one I've got is uh, Meredith G uh, gave us $5 and said, Honey for the Badger's internet bill. Um, I'll let you go with yours next. Okay, so today these are these are these are chat or these were sent through just the tip. They weren't sent through during the show, but they were sent through um, after the show today or not before the show today. So the first one was from uh, Silver Bullet, and Silver Bullet says, "I hope this helps keeps the lights on." And of course, it does. The super chats do indeed help keep the lights on in the in the Badger Cave, which I very much value. Uh, because it has actually been extremely useful. Of course, it wasn't the, the last two years. I haven't been able to put in any, any kind of events, and it may be a long time before I'm able to travel again uh, until the uh, <laughs> until the Canadian government gives me back my right citizen rights to mobility, if ever. Um, but uh, when we do, then it'll be useful again. Um, it's it's sometimes extremely difficult to put on very in, very involved events without a space to do staging. So thank you for that, Silver Bullet. And Michael B sends oh that was ten dollars from Silver Bullet. Michael B sends us a ten dollar tip as well and says just the tip. <laughs> <laughs> and again, if you want to join uh, Michael B and Silver Bullet, it is feedthebadger.com slash just the tip. We can take tips through there after the show as well and i will do my best to make sure that your tips get read out on some show or the next or a show that 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 the that you know the next show essentially all right and we okay have, back to you from youtube we have uh richard pierre gave us um dollar 99 and said there will be more opportunities for women and that was during the discussion about um 
women and men in the workplace and uh, opportunities being taken away from men and uh, women basically shitting on men's work. Um, and yeah, there there will always be more and more opportunities for women. And, and um, it's not a bad thing for there to be opportunities for women. It's a bad thing for it to come at the expense of opportunities for men. And it's, it's especially a bad thing for it to be an entitlement at the expense of opportunities for men. Um, I always like to say, if you want, like a girl, to stop being a disparaging remark, stop defining feminin femininity around privileges and uh, entitlements that come at the expense of male obligation. And then, like a girl, won't be an insult anymore. Um, we have Cross Malachi gave us $20. Oh, no, no, gave us $5 20 minutes ago. <laughs> um, very different. But gave us $5 and said, Mr. Enter did a series called Technocracy about a lot of this. And that sounds interesting, actually. Um, and he's, he was talking about uh, our Allison's discussion about social media. Uh, that... Um, influence of social media on the order of things and the way things are established. Uh, so that that sounds like it would be an interesting thing to watch because as people start recognizing it, we're going to see more and more. Like, it's it's been 10 years pretty much since I started seeing organized feminist efforts at uh, controlling the... Um, ability to use social media to get your message out, right? At, at controlling the social environment of social media through uh, the, the creation of these trust and safety um, groups within companies that, that, that determine that. And it actually, it, I saw it start before that um, in, in a less official capacity on, on Reddit of all places with a feminist subreddit called Shit Reddit Says that organized to eliminate subreddits they didn't like. And all the subreddits they didn't like, like there are subreddits for all kinds of things that are um, maybe gross or disgusting or um, socially unacceptable or, uh, I don't know, uh, things that a lot of people would simply just not want to be involved with, right? And, uh, you know, like, it's not my thing to go into the, the um, I don't know if they've been eliminated yet or not, into the subreddits that are that exist to show gore, for instance, which I've run into uh, by accident and in the past and really don't want to go in there again. Um, really not my thing. Like, I can, I got the stomach for it, but not the heart. It just made me cry. Um, and, I mean, it should. But uh, the subreddits that were not respectful, properly respectful to women, and uh, the subreddits that were sexually offensive to women, you know, like, those subreddits are all gone. And those were eliminated because of that subreddit, making an organized effort to get rid of them. And they weren't even fully honest about what was contained in them or what was being done uh, by, the, by the users. Uh, they they basically they didn't even have to tell the truth to to get that eliminated. They um, they actually made them sound far worse than they really were, uh, and uh, yeah. So that effort that effort has been going on. I would I would say probably since uh, it was probably around two thousand seven when the debate happened um, over. Uh, getting rid of the men's rights subreddit and that I was part of um, under my oldest Reddit account that is long gone, and and that was that was driven by feminists as well uh, and supported by non-feminist women as well. Um, mm. So you know, and this is this is really rough because I was like one of the very few women on the why should you eliminate this subreddit side, uh, where I was like you know we have I, I I went through and found several feminist subreddits. And I listed them, and I'm like, all these subreddits exist for women to express their grievances and talk about their issues without male control over the conversation. 
and yet you're telling me that men cannot have one, one subreddit to express their grievances and discuss their issues that isn't controlled by women? Give me a reason why. Mm, and uh, nobody of they could. can't. Yeah, nobody and, could. And uh, that subreddit, I think, is, well, it's still there. Mm -hmm. It's like, of all the, the men's forums, I think that one's the one that managed to maintain it. And it's been under for steady attack reason. for 15 years. Yep. And the funny thing is, is if you point out that these social media accounts or these social media platforms are controlled by feminists, you're a misogynist. Mm -hmm. And so, but they are patently. Like feminists control the discourse on these social media accounts and non-feminist women or feminist women who are women who are feminine, who use feminism's tools, but you know, are too craven to actually have the title. Um, the, cause I, you know, in some ways I, I respect feminists. At least they, they announce themselves. They're like, yeah, I'm a feminist. I will use these abusive tools against both men and women, but women who just use the tools, they're like, yeah, I'm not even gonna call myself a feminist. Cause I don't even want to take the heat for using the tools. Uh, but they still use them. So mm -hmm. anyway, the, but those women control the landscape, the, the, what can be talked about and what, what can be discussed. And, so Twitter is shaped completely by women's self sensibilities. Well, a subset of women who are, are, are more feminine or, or who are, well, let's just call them cisgendered. Like, I mean, let's, let's face it. The women who are more masculine get sort of pushed out of these kind of endeavors almost invariably. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you're a masculine woman, what the hell do you do? Masculinity you is toxic. You get called a pick me. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, you get called a pick me, and you get pushed out, and you don't you don't get heard by what 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 you're comfortable with with the community. So it it is it is utterly controlled by cisgendered, so women who are not just recognize themselves as biological women, but are also feminine women, and it gets controlled by them because of their desire to play the victim. And what comes out of these spaces is a direct result of their attitudes. And yet, if you say you are responsible for this, they will call you a misogynist. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm <sighs> I got to still I gotta check my dog. He's eating. Something. Right. I am still getting replies from a like this conversation started in July of last year with a with a woman who suggested that abortion should be used to uh, protect children from abuse and poverty. Right? What? Yeah, well, you know, apparently killing them before they're born is not abuse. I know. Right? So, and, and then this, this conversation has attracted dozens of, of feminists responding to it. Most of which, you know, like, they, they respond for a while and then they block. Or they respond for a while and then they say something so heated that even they get busted for it. Um, mm -hmm. And every, t every time somebody misgenders me, like, all the people that read my tweets, when I respond to it and point out, no, I'm female, you, you're calling me a man and I'm female, and then the feminist insists, you know, insists on continuing the behavior they report those tweets. And I know it's happening because I'll go back and try to uh, reference earlier parts of the conversation and those feminists that are doing that are getting banned. Like, the the account suspended um, phenomenon in that conversation is just like half the conversation now, when you look at it, is this tweet... They're Account suspended, account suspended, account suspended, account suspended, account suspended. They are unbelievably and, yeah. aggressive when it comes to policing ex what is acceptable behavior. Yeah. Like that, yeah. And, and if you don't evince it, then they take away your gender identity. Yep. Of course, they can't do that anymore, but they used to do that quite freely. But I am still getting like freak out responses from women in that conversation because I said, if you choose to have sex, choose a partner that that is a no-strings-attached partner, you don't plan on making a family with him, and, and uh, he doesn't plan on making a family with you, right? Then choose 
to use less than two different types of birth control, you, you know, choose to fail at, at effectively protecting your uterus from having surviving se semen enter it, um, and then choose to carry to term and give birth, and then choose to retain custody of the child instead of opting for paternal custody or adoption or even safe haven abandonment. It is your fault that you are responsible for the child. It's your fault that you have a child under your care that you are now financially challenged to provide for. It is not his fault that you are in that situation because you made all of those choices. If you choose not to make, you got to wear a condom, part of your conditions for consent, and, and then you complain that, gosh, I've been affected, affected by, by the biological function of a sperm. Um, that's your fault. You have more control than anyone else over what goes into your body, who you have sex with, how you do it, and, and what you allow to happen as a result of it, right? That is the most offensive thing you can say to a woman. The, the, the consequences of your actions are your fault and you have the power to protect yourself from those consequences and you should use it. Like, that's not a mean thing to say. That's advice. That's, here's how to protect yourself from the shit that happens as a result of those, or those, those consequences. The, the poverty, the judgment of society, the challenges of raising a child by yourself, the, the treatment that you get from, from your child because the child hasn't learned how to value mom from how dad values mom, right? All of the many things that happen to you and your child, watching your child fall over and over again because he didn't get all of the nurturing he needed. He only got all of the nurturing you could provide, right? And feeling responsible for it, protecting yourself from all of that is something you can do. It's within your grasp. It's within your power. And here's how to do it. And you should use that. Like, that's advice. That's not meanness, right? right. That's, that's better than here's a safety net. It's here's how to prevent yourself from needing a dozen safety nets that are designed to strangle you. And yet, I've been dealing with, you're a gender traitor. You must, you must be a man. You hate women. I love that one. You hate women. You want to protect women from experiences that are harsh and terrible that don't have to happen to them. You must hate them. Shame on you. Uh, and and uh, you don't think very much of men because you don't want to make them solely responsible for women's protection and safety, right? I've been dealing with that since July. <laughs> since July, and it's it, it's been dozens, literally dozens of women that I've heard it from. And no, it they're not like all feminists. The, Some of them get the mad Memorial if you call Day feminist. Tweet. Yeah, and and I I mean on one hand, you know, I love. Twitter is my version of, of enjoying getting into a bar fight, and I will admit it. That's that's the <laughs> to to be to be racial about it. That's my Irish ancestry coming out, right? And maybe my Scottish ancestry too, and my Viking ancestry. Pretty much all of my ancestry. Um, <laughs> but but at the other end of it, I hate it because it hurts to see women be that intellectually disabled without being intellectually disabled, like. It's, it's, having a handicap is hard. Having a handicap makes your life um, more of a struggle in order to be happy, right? So when the handicap is natural, you know, you, you have compassion for people in that situation and you, you do what you can to help them. But when the, when the handicap is self-inflicted and the people who have it willfully fight tooth and nail to maintain it. It's like watching somebody slowly kill themselves with heroin. Yeah. It is 100% if somebody isn't recognizing the con their actions as part of who you are, they don't recognize your full humanity. Yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. Like that there there is like I'm currently going through and researching stuff about uh, civic humanism in, in, in 
And our concept of what it is to be human is tied in with a recognition of how our actions affect the greater world. When women don't get that recognition, they're, the people who don't give it to them aren't recognizing their full humanity. Full yeah. stop. And to, to turn around and say that people, your actions, you and the greater society, and say that they are anti-women? No. No, friend. No. It's a fundamental aspect of recognizing something. And when you don't do it, you don't really respect them. No matter how much you talk about drinking to respect women juice. If you don't recognize women's actions and their effect on the greater world, you don't respect women. Yeah. And uh, to make it a crime, a thought crime, to even recognize the effects of women's actions on themselves, which that in that particular thing it is. Uh, you know, you, you're basically telling women, just throw away your humanity. You don't get to be human, right? You're going to be a porcelain doll. You're going to sit on a shelf, and we're gonna we're gonna worship you as a representation of goddessness. But you're not allowed, in your spare time, even from being worshipped in that manner. You're not allowed in your spare time to be human enough to recognize your role in bringing about the consequences you experience from your own actions. Like, that's and then, incredible. And we're going to call it empowerment. Yeah, and we're going to call, gonna empowerment. call it empowerment. We're going to oh make gosh. you feel like you have absolutely no... You can't take any actions to affect any outcomes. There's no connection between your outcomes and consequences. And we're going to call that fucking empowerment. And it's yeah. not something men are doing to women, right? That's not a patriarchal oppression narrative right there. Women are doing that to women. That's that's exactly what I was going to say. And it, I think it's their most effective tool because women against each other are extremely competitive. So, of course, you know, and, and then, you know, when you have uh, a, a group of people who are they they're, they just that's all they want to be is the porcelain doll. Right. They have resentment for anyone else who doesn't just want to be sitting on the shelf the same way that they are. Yeah. And and, oh, and they God, have to be the highest doll on the shelf too, right? Y yes. And the prettiest. But but how dare you not want to be up there with them, right? Right. And and if you fall off that shelf, and and you break, how dare your shards not fly out and hurt some guy? Because obviously it's his fault. No matter which way you leaned before you fell. Um, right. but no, you, no, yeah. that, you you built that shelf too high. It's it's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the shelf that women built and men are responsible for. Um, <laughs> like everything else, uh, it's it's just sad. And and like I said, it does. It it's it's uh it's my uh my my weakness of of uh you know wanting to get into the Twitter bar fight, but at the other end of it, I I always come away with from from that from reading these women's um expression of offense at being told how wonderfully human they are and can be um and and terms that they find just too harsh forms of communication and too uh too real to be um acceptable right that it just it is saddening and, and i come away from it sad and it is all i can think about is this is this is the lot in life that the women who run the social order of things have have decided should be the female lot in life, not the lot of doing great mm. things and being able to recognize a great impact on society, or even just being valued within their their s social circle as somebody who is kind and loving and caring and and uh, diligent and all of the things that that we expect of men. Nope. Um, you have to be the porcelain doll, and in order to be the porcelain doll, you ha you know, in order to force that porcelain doll hood on other people, you have to model being the porcelain doll. And, it's and don't you dare sad. say, don't you dare say, maybe it's a bad idea to put the doll behind the wheel or the behind the the throttle of an airplane. <laughs> yeah, put the porcelain might, doll might not, behind the throttle. Might, might not, might no, might not work. <laughs> This is, don't don't put the porcelain doll at the head of the boardroom. You know, if you can't tell women or 
train women to the same degree as you train men to see the consequences of their actions. Don't put them in a position where we rely on them to understand that in order to make decisions. Yeah. Because porcelain dolls don't belong in boardrooms. They don't belong as in cockpits. They don't belong as soldiers. So one or the other feminists, either women or porcelain dolls, who cannot be told and, and have their consequences of their actions recognized like a full human, or they are, and you have to accept that and allow them to make decisions for society. Because there's, if what we're doing right now is we're putting porcelain dolls in positions of power, and those porcelain dolls are useless and destructive. And it doesn't mean women are useless and destructive. It means the role that feminists expect women to occupy is useless and destructive when it's in a position of power. Yeah, yeah. When you take away the thing that defines the humanity of human beings, uh, you make them useless and destructive. Whether it's um, making men disposable or making women unaccountable. So there you go. And at one end we have uh, we have obvious physical terrorism that people recognize. And at the other end, we have social terrorism that our whole society is vulnerable to because most people aren't aware that that's what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, last super chat that I have um, is from, it's not called that, it's from Rumble. It's a, called a Rumble, what? Rant. Rant, a Rumble Rumble rant. rant. We got a Rumble rant from Jonathan Doman who said three of my favorite ladies and sent us $10. Um, and thank you for sending through Rumble because they don't take as much as Twitter so, or as Twitter, as uh, YouTube. as YouTube. So uh, again, YouTube, YouTube takes a piece of your soul. Yeah, they do. I swear, um, but they can't and have they it. Also, they also sometimes yoink stuff because they say it's too controversial. Yeah, but they can't have it because, as we just established, women aren't allowed to have souls. So yeah. <laughs> and with that, oh my god! Uh, wait, 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 wait! I got one. I got okay, one. Okay. Okay, I got from Math Freak one two three plus HBR, which I hope isn't your actual name. Um, thank you all for the thought provoking talk tonight, and uh, thank you for the five dollars through feedthebadger.com slash just the tip. So, um, and again, you can go through there at any time. It doesn't isn't just during the streams. Yes. So thank you, Math Freak. And you and, can provoke uh, the thoughts you. with with freer speech. Although think, what we're allowed to read on YouTube might be a different story. Yeah, eh. yeah. yeah but, like the, the thing is that it's much easier to uh, moderate written comments, yeah. I think, than than things that people say. Yeah. Um, it's much more difficult to go through that. I'm actually pretty sure that the one that we got zinged on, we had a, a verbo verboten person's name in the title. Ah, uh, um, yeah, that might actually. Part... Yeah, yeah. But... The yep, we we you, spoke of the unperson. Once the you are un socially executed, you're not allowed to go into YouTube's, even in other people's titles and and speeches. So yeah, but we have not yet been socially executed in mass. Um, Karen's been a little socially executed. They banned her on Twitter quite a while ago, and Brian's been a little socially executed. Um, also banned, you know, on Twitter. Yep, banned, banned on Twitter. Banned briefly on on Facebook. Yeah. Um, so. uh, by the way, just just a note: my dog was eating a piece of wood oh, that God. he got from a table. I'm like, apparently it was not his fault. It just fell off, and he just opportunely snapped it up. And uh, got to get that fiber, he, you know. Yeah. Well, he 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 likes his sticks, and this one was just was was you know, it was as it was a stick of opportunity, shall there we say. Go. Calling his yeah. name. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it could be worse. I had a friend who had a dog that was half Labrador Retriever and half German Shepherd. And he used to fetch everything in the house, whether it was asked of him or not, and then compile it into a little pile <laughs> in his space and then guard it because it was his now. And he <laughs> ate... Ate... I'm telling you, like, chewed up and ate the dryer vent. Oh, my God. Wow. And it Actually, wasn't a plastic no, this, one. This, uh, my, my Scipio is a German Shepherd. Um, he, uh, we have heard horror stories. He's not really a horror story, although we are sort of struggling with him lunging at, at 
cars and barking at children yeah. he's particularly concerned about children he's like these these small humans are suspicious yeah, they are <laughs> I know they some... definitely are i know someone so who might up like to something. meet that dog <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can only imagine what he'd do if he's oh my this goodness is... but they just um, blow his mind yeah <laughs> That's one of the most fun things about dogs, though, is it's so easy to blow their minds. <laughs> and they're easily entertained. Um, just like me sometimes. I might be a bit of a dog. <laughs> uh, but with that, um, we will we will cut off the end, just the tip of, of the uh, super long sausage. It's not really all that super long. It's not even 9.30 Be yet. the badger, just yes. slash just the tip. Yep. So uh, I'll remind everybody... Um, a couple of things, uh, and and Allison might be better at this, but um, having talked about male disposability, I think it's important that we also talk about male community, and you know we have one of those <laughs> that that we have have cultivated um, at, at at as part of the Honey Badger Brigade's work. Uh, we have actually yeah. two. We have our our, um, uh, our our main Discord, and there's also a fan Discord. And there's mm -hmm. a great community in each one of those that is very supportive of each other and has a great time together. And a lot of important discussions take place that are, are very helpful to the people who are in those communities, involved in those communities, and also um, that are very helpful to us. So, but Allison's the one that has the information on how to become yep. part of those communities. So to become part of the community, uh, our, bis our Discord community, you go to badgernation.online and you just have to set up a account with uh, Discord. And uh, I, I would actually recommend downloading it to your desktop. I know nobody has desktops anymore, but or get the app and, and creating the account that way rather than going through the website to create the account. Because when you do that, you never see that account again. It's really bizarre. Um, but yes, it's uh, badgernation.online. And we have regular activities such as the screening, the movie screening that I was setting up earlier, and um, lots of uh, conversation. Uh, it's uh, you know if you if you get a subscription, you'll also get access to it, and it's uh, it opens up all of the patron areas, uh, which includes a archive of past shows, no matter what platform they are on, and after shows, um, and uh, other stuff like meetups and uh suggestions we get from our patrons we often take patron suggestions for show topics and it just it's it's good to be able to develop a community where men are supporting each other and i know this isn't exactly a men's it's got women in it but the women who are in it understand the rules of the community so they don't go in and say okay this is speech that i don't like you have to stop and it's more about providing a buffer for men to be able to talk about the things that they want to talk about and support each other. The women are there. And um, so to use an example, there was a one feminist once came into our, uh, our, our chat on YouTube and started to pontificate about how the community that we had constructed, Honey Badger Radio, Honey Badger Brigade constructed in many ways by me, Karen, Hannah, Lauren, Prem, and everybody else, all the women who, who put the work in to make this community happen was anti-female. And I basically did the how dare with her until she left. And that's the point. Mm -hmm. You know, we can use this ability to set the social, the social expectations, the social tenor to actually protect men's right to take care or to have friendships, to talk in the way that they want, to be free to express themselves and support each other. And that's the, what, the way I view it yeah. um, in this space. So it's, it's it end up, and one of the problems that I've seen is that spaces like this, they invite women in, the women do not account for their the social expectations they do not account for the fact that their their particular uh way of interacting and their particular sensibilities and their sense of offense shouldn't be what is used to allow speech or disallow speech 
and they just take it over and they turn it into a crater. Yeah. And that's not all women. It's not all women because we're also sort of protecting the women who don't want to be in uh, the, the minefield of a feminine space. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. So that that's that's the whole thing behind the space. Um, once again, I don't I don't think it should replace purely male spaces where men are completely divorced from women. But I think it has a role in terms of providing a space that remains protected. Because again, I've seen I've seen it happen over and over again. You if know, they it's, don't it's... if you don't have women who understand this, women get invited in, they do not abide by the rules, and then destroy everything. It's actually important for women to be exposed to a space like that too, because um, it's there's a, a mental weakness that you develop when you are constantly surrounded by kowtowing, right? And what we have is um, an, an accurate statement about it, basically, is, is that it is not a space that privileges women's sensibilities over men's interests and needs, right? It's a male-friendly space, it's a masculinity-friendly space, and it's a space where women don't get to tell men how masculinity should be defined. And when women can brave a space like that, it helps them grow. So there's nothing... There, you know, there's not even a, a validity, a remote validity to the complaint that uh, women are, are somehow disadvantaged in a space like that. Because actually, in being good in for men, it's also good for women. There's no drawback yeah. to this. So if you want to help us construct that kind of space, if you want to dig in and build it, it's badgernation.online. All right. And while I'm at it. Um, the last thing I will say before closing us out of this super long sausage now, <laughs> we're, we're at actually 930, um, mocking because there are some nights that we've actually gone uh, four hours on this show. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, t tonight we have an a a especially interesting um, bit of lack of self-awareness in a feminist writer. And I just have to share, this is the, the article that we're going over in the patron uh, show after after the show tonight. The, the writer, um, uh, uh, Alexis Grinnell, has decided that the, the situation of pregnancy is just not fair to women, and we should char start charging men to have babies. Because we're <laughs> not doing that already. Through any kind of system, or anything. Wait... Wait, that Wait. is the the actual title. Let's start charging okay, but, men to have babies. Well, but but let's entertain her. If we start charging men for the service of having babies, then men should get the service of being fathers. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If if we make it a direct payment, <laughs> then uh, then yeah, I, like all right, you just bought the right to be a dad. Gosh, it just it just blows my mind. Let's start. Let's start charging men to have babies so <laughs> oh um uh, yeah if if you if you want to enjoy it's, the torture it is, it is of like watching us read through articles like this <laughs> it is induced stupidity uh, like it is a chosen I, I don't even know if it's chosen it's foisted on her i'm i'm sure she has an average intellect but that statement is so myopic it's it's like her brain is swaddled in cotton. Yeah, it is it is profoundly stupid. Um and and the rest of the article is is just as bad. But again, it's it's something that uh I won't go any further into it because it is reserved for for the patron only after show, which I, and again, I don't know all the particulars of how to participate in that, so I'm going to put Allison on no, the spot. No, you just you One just get, a, get you get a subscription at feedthebadger.com. Uh, on a recurring subscription, you go to the Discord, you get access to the after show. Well, depending on which amount you get, or you can get a recording access to uh, you can get access to the after show just watching it, or you can take part and uh, discuss things with Hannah uh, directly. And uh, that's at feedthebadger.com. Alrighty. And with that, I will cut off the end of the sausage. So thanks everybody for uh, for sticking out this particularly. Uh, this has been a spicy sausage. Um, with the the topic that we covered tonight it was a, a really harsh one. Uh, so thanks everybody for listening as well to to this difficult subject to to consider and to deal with. And my two co-hosts for for uh, 
very profound discussion. And uh, thanks to everybody who works in the background to make HBR talk happen. And good night, all. Men's right activists are machines, dude, okay? They are literal machines. They are talking point machines. They are impossible to fucking deal with, especially if you have like, especially if you have like a, a couple dudes who have good memory on top of that too. Holy shit, you're fucked.